We know that you're a golfer, an author, theologian, Herman, and I'd like to just begin by giving you an opportunity, especially for those that weren't with us in Sunday school, just a little bit of your background, your professional background in particular, and we'll talk about your spiritual background and so forth. Sure. Well, I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington, and my dad was in the restaurant business. He was a chef, and he took the concessions at the West Seattle Golf Course. Uh, he got into golf, playing golf, and became a very avid golfer and pretty good amateur golfer. And two years later, at the age of 10, I started playing golf, caddying for him, and I got pretty serious about it. And I, uh, You were a late starter compared to Tiger Woods. Oh, I know. It. Yeah, they start them young nowadays. Um, did well in junior golf in my area and then won a national junior uh, golf tournament uh, put on by Hearst newspapers. Got some recognition from some of the golf coaches at universities. And uh, Dave Williams down at the University of Houston uh, called me and uh, I decided to go ahead and go to school there on a part scholarship. And so I attained some success in college golf and won the NC2A individual championship in 1962 and led my team to the team title. And then uh, I went on the tour after I did a stint in the Army uh, 1964, I started the tour. Uh, took me four years to win a tournament. 1968, my first win, Kaiser International out in Napa, California. And then uh, many, many years later, I got on the Seniors Tour, which is now called the Champions Tour, when you're age 50 or above. And I won my only tournament on that tour at Napa Valley also. So I, me and Billy Casper are the only two guys that ever won on the regular tour and on the senior champions tour at the same venue. Uh, but anyway, I played uh, for 18 years full time on the regular tour from 64 through 82. And won twice on that tour that were official, uh, let's see, I won five times total, two of them were unofficial. Uh, the money's still official, it goes in the bank. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, but uh, I finished second 15 times, <laughs> which is quite a few compared to how many times I won. Uh, my closest, uh, I ever came to winning a major championship. Major is the U.S. Open, British Open, PGA uh, here in the U.S. and the Masters. Was the U.S. Open in 1972? I was leading the tournament, and uh, then Jack Nicklaus won. So uh, Jack did his usual thing. Just, uh, but uh, had a good life. Uh, started the PGA Tour Bible Study in 1965. Maybe we'll get into that in a minute. Okay. I guess I noticed as I look out at the golfers, you know, they're nodding along, and others that are, that are not are kind of giving you some blank stares. So yeah. I guess we know the golfers from the non-golfers here. But uh, uh, we're gonna, and maybe when you mentioned about the U.S. Open, this may not be the same year, but in a little bit we're gonna come back because I remember you sharing a story about a real significant spiritual breakthrough yeah. during a time you played the U.S. Open. But let, let's kind of back up for a moment, Kermit, and. If you'd just share a little bit about your spiritual background as we lead in, especially when we're going to talk about one of your books here in just a few moments, but just tell us a little bit about your spiritual background. Okay, well, I was, I was saying in the Sunday school class that I didn't come from a religious home, but my parents had respect for Christianity and Christians because they had come from uh, church-going families. And so I grew up going to Sunday school, and my Sunday school teacher, a uh, student at the University of Washington, led me to Christ when I was 13 years old. I hadn't really understood uh, God's plan of salvation up to that time. I thought uh, persons are Christian just by, you know, trying to be good, going to church. Uh, and then my uh, Sunday school teacher had us memorize 10 verses in the Bible. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 really got my attention there. Uh, that we're saved by faith, not of works. 
And so I questioned Gordy about that after a Sunday school class one day, uh, just him and I. And then he led me in a prayer to receive Jesus into my heart as my Lord and Savior. That's what I think makes a person a Christian, to believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. He died for us on the cross. doesn't have anything to do with the idea of whether Jesus is God or not. He's my Savior. That's what communion's about. Jesus instituted communion. So that's how I was saved and then grew in Christian life through the years after that. Mm -hmm. With that, I want to take you back, and this is one of the key reasons I wanted to have you share with us today, was you shared at a, at a breakfast some weeks ago about an experience where you came to recognize the truth about Jesus and about God uh, while you were playing the U.S. Open, as I recall. If you'd share some about that story, I just found that so compelling. Yeah. Well, I was taught the doctrine of the Trinity when I went to college and started attending a Bible t uh, church, just much like this, um, an independent Bible church, and they were very serious about studying the Bible. And so I was taught the doctrine of the Trinity, just like most Christians are in their churches. And I didn't uh, question it uh, until 20 years later. Uh, I was uh, studying Jesus' Olivet Discourse, which he gave shortly before his crucifixion, and he uh, talked about the future. Uh, he referenced uh, some Old Testament passages like Daniel and uh, talked about his second coming, and he said he didn't know the time of his second coming. He said only the Father knows it. And I knew the, the saying, that saying of Jesus quite well, but it just hit me like it never had before. And so I, I thought, if Jesus doesn't know, and yet the Father knows, and both are God, according to the doctrine of the Trinity, and they both are equally God in every way, the Father doesn't know any more than Jesus knows about the future, then how can this be right? Now, I knew about the doctrine of the hypostatic union of Christ. You know, Jesus has two natures, human nature and divine nature. And that was often used as a grid to interpret the gospel sayings of Jesus. And so it was done in my church uh, concerning this saying. Uh, and so I was taught that Jesus made this statement about the timing of his return on the basis of his human nature. But he really did know when he was going to return in his divine nature. And I thought to myself, that makes Jesus look like a liar. He said he didn't know the time of his return, and yet he really does. Not only that, I thought it made him look kind of schizophrenic. And I thought, not going there anymore. I will stand on the integrity of Jesus. And so that's when I began to question it, and I studied it for about three years. And then in 1982, I was playing in the U.S. Open, and once again it was at my favorite golf course, Pebble Beach, which is where... I had a chance to win the U.S. Open in 1972. We were playing at Pebble Beach. And so here I am playing in my favorite tournament and my favorite golf course. And I shot a good second round. But every evening I'm coming back to where I'm staying, which was in a private home, Christians. And they had a theological library right in the room where I, the bedroom where I was. So I was coming back to that place and studying theology into the wee hours of the night, which I should have been doing. <laughs> should have been going to bed. And so on Sunday morning at 3 o'clock in the morning, I had this gut-wrenching prayer. And I was praying all the time about this. And I made my decision to God, no, I do not believe that your word your scripture, Father, 
teaches that your son, Jesus Christ, is also God just like you are. It does not say that. And so I made this decision. It was, you know, this was really, I knew I was getting into. I knew I was going to lose most of my best friends, which I did. And so that's when I made my decision. And I kept it fairly quiet. And I had various different reasons for doing that, which I don't have time to get into. And then eventually wrote this book after researching and studying this for a long time. I guess I'm just trying to imagine what it was like for the very first time to address Jesus for who he is and God for who he is. That had to be a pretty powerful moment when you came to that understanding and, and changed, I guess, your prayer and worship life, I would think. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I always did pray to the Father. Uh, I don't know, you know, I probably prayed to Jesus some, but uh, Jesus had taught us how to pray. I mean, it's very clear. You know, when the disciples came to him after listening to Jesus pray at various different times, and they were quite impressed, obviously, and they asked, they said, teach us to pray. And he said, well, pray in this manner, our Father who is in heaven, and then make these petitions. And so it was this pray to the Father. Um, but yes, it was really a, a life-changing experience for me um, to go from this belief that God is three, you know, that there are three persons in a Godhead, which the concept of a Godhead isn't even in the Bible, neither is the word Trinity in describing God, uh, things that, you know, I was realizing right from the beginning when I got into this study. And then Jesus was never saying in any of his many gospel sayings in the New Testament, I am God, or anything like that. Uh, the closest that he ever comes, according to, uh, I call people who believe that Jesus is God, traditionalists because it's a tradition that developed in early, uh, well, church history. And, uh, <clears throat> and this becomes the tradition that the church has believed in, that God is three. Uh, uh, traditionalists, when you ask them, what is the main saying of Jesus in the four Gospels of the New Testament, in which he says that he's God. Well, there isn't anything straight out like that, which that's the first thing I noticed when I got into this. I said, wow, Jesus never straight out comes out and expressly states, I am God, or anything like that. But when you ask them, well, what verse can you point to? And they say, well, it's in John 10, 30, when Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And when I looked at that, for the first time in this new study I was making, I thought that's the closest they can come up with, with Jesus claiming to be God. I think there's good reason to question this just because of that. So that's, that's what happens to you. That sets you on a journey to eventually writing a book, largely dealing with this, which I have before me here. In fact. You have a track that's part of the, the beginning of this book called The Real Jesus, which I believe you brought copies to share with us today. But uh, th that, that understanding led you to write a book, which obviously took a long time to put a book such as this together. And uh, I know you state largely it is a reference book. And so with that, I've got the, the Real Jesus track at the beginning and also your preface. But uh, I was thinking this statement right at the beginning of the book, Jesus of Nazareth is the most famous man who has ever lived, but who was he? That's primarily the issue that you're addressing there. And uh, you've come to the conclusion he's God's son, but not God himself. Right. The son of God, not God the son. And what does it mean, son of God? And of course, that's a big issue in this uh, disagreement that we have with the church. 
what does it mean for Jesus to be the Son of God? Uh, church fathers began to believe that because a man has a son and that son grows up and becomes a man, that God having a son, the same thing must happen. That's where they go astray. <clears throat> That's uh, Greek metaphysics. That's not Hebrew teaching. That's not Jewish teaching. Nothing like that is in the Bible. God is not physical. And so we can't compare those two like that. Son of God means that whoever the individual is who is a son of God, this is my belief, that that person has a relationship with God. That's what it's all about. Son of God has to do with relationship. And so Jesus has this very intimate relationship with God. When we look back in the Old Testament, we find that the, the expression Son of God is applied to angels, Genesis 6 and other places, uh, men, excuse me, that's wrong, not Genesis 6, uh, but, but men, the king of Israel, is called the son of God. And so, <clears throat> now Jesus has this very intimate relationship with God, and that's why he's the son of God. Uh, just as God said to from, from the sky uh, when Jesus was baptized and transfigured, uh, this is my beloved son. And so I think that's what it means for Jesus to be the son of God. Mm. To go the direction you've gone, though, is not popular. You say no. you've lost friends. You've been counseled by uh, some well-known individuals concerning the direction you've gone. I, I guess I'd like you to share with us a little bit about, shall we say, the price you paid for exploring this issue, which seems like an important issue to explore. Yeah, uh, I have paid the price. Lost ministry. Um, I co-founded the PJ Tour Bible Study. 1964 and led it uh, for most of the years afterwards, 18 years. Um, <clears throat> when I, and then I became a Christian uh, author uh, after that, in the interim period between the two tours, um, when I was ages 42 to 49, I didn't play professional golf uh, very much at all. Uh, I played full time up until then, but then when I turned 50, I became eligible for the senior tour, which was renamed the Champions Tour. And so I went on that tour, resumed my, resumed my full time professional golf career when I was 50 years of age. And uh, Chapel had been started on that tour four years prior, which of course happened because of the PGA Tour Bible study. Uh, when I came out there on that tour, some of my friends uh, knew that I, uh, in fact, only a few of them, uh, knew that I did not hold to the so-called orthodox teaching about the identity of Jesus. And so I didn't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, and I didn't believe in the deity of Christ. I believe Jesus was my Lord. He's my Savior. Uh, <clears throat> but not God. And so because of that, they ostracized me. I could come to the meetings, but I couldn't participate. And I certainly could not have any leadership. And here I had started the, the ministry way back, you know, almost 30 years prior. And so in a way, I thought it was kind of comical. But uh, I didn't... Uh, ruffle any feathers. And I just decided I'm going to keep peace. Uh, I had other reasons for it. I wanted to be a Christian author. If I came out publicly about what I believed on this, that would have been the end of me uh, being a, a Christian author. Um, and so anyway, that's, uh, that's what was going on with me. Mm. In a sense with that, Kermit, you've kind of 
I don't draw a line in the sand, but, but your purpose in writing this book that we have, the, the restitution of Jesus Christ, you say, my primary purpose is to persuade readers that the Bible does not require that people believe in the traditional doctrine of the Trinity, the incarnation, and thus the deity of Christ, in order to become a true believer in Christ. Many of us in this room hardly agree with that, but that becomes a real sticking point for many, unfortunately. Yes. Well, that's why I said that when I uh, was brought to Christ at age 13, that I received Jesus into my life as my Lord and Savior. And that's how evangelicals have understood the gospel. You know, they have proclaimed that Jesus is Lord and Savior that God raised him from the dead on the third day. Uh, let's look at some scriptures on this. Uh, John 3. <clears throat> Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. Jesus says, you are the teacher of Israel. There's an article there. And so Nicodemus was an outstanding te Torah teacher. Torah, what's that? The law of Moses. And so uh, he comes to Jesus at night and he says, we know you've come from God for no man can do the things that you can do unless God is with him. Nicodemus had seen and known about some of the works, the miraculous works of Jesus. And what does Jesus say to him? You need to be born again, born anew, born from above. And he explained, it's by the Spirit of God. And so then he goes on and he, he says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now, what's that all about? Well, the Israelites, during the Exodus, uh, snakes had come into the camp and people were bitten, poisonous snakes. And they were about to die and some of them were dying. And Moses made a a serpent out of brass, I guess, and put it on his staff and held it up and said, look up here at this and you'll be healed. Scripture tells us that's what happened. And so Jesus uses that event to, as a type of his upcoming crucifixion. And so he says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Lift it up on a stake, just like that bronze serpent was. And Jesus is talking about his crucifixion. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so <clears throat> this is what personal salvation is about. It's believing that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. He's our savior. Believe that and you'll be saved. And so that's what I did when I was 13 years old. That's how I became a Christian. That's what makes a person a real Christian. Now, we should also recognize Jesus as Lord and follow his teachings as best we can. And so what does Paul uh, say about the gospel in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10? He says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's how you're saved. Um, I could go on and on on this, but it doesn't have anything to do with believing whether or not Jesus is God. The salvation passages, they never say anything about that. Uh, the, the, second thing, the first thing I did, Steve, when I got into this was, okay, I'm going to look and see what Jesus says about himself. What does he say? calls himself the son of man all the time. So who is Jesus? We've got to say the very first thing that Jesus is, is he's the son of man. What does that mean? Well, I think Jesus is referencing Daniel chapter 17, verse 13 and 14, uh, which we don't have time to get to, but uh, <clears throat> this one like the son of man, incidentally, I think, that word in Hebrew, K, uh, that's trying to say like, references Jesus' virgin birth. 
But at any rate, one like the Son of Man is brought to the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days refers to God the Father. And he's given a kingdom. And this is the kingdom that Jesus preaches about all the time and teaches in his parables. And the kingdom is here, the realized kingdom. But the kingdom is also eschatological. So it has another stage that's going to happen in the future at the second coming of Christ. And so this is when the Son of Man brings his kingdom. So Jesus is this great Son of Man who will be king over all the earth, not just over Israel. So Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. But Israel is just a tiny little nation, and God has revealed himself through Israel. And this is how the Gentiles find out about this God, is because of this witness that God has made through Israel. But Jesus is going to be the Son of Man. He is the Son of Man who will be the King and Lord of all the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and so getting back to your, your question, Steve, uh, which was what? <laughs> <laughs> I think I forgot. <laughs> but your, your purpose in writing the book, I guess, was where we had started on that, uh, that insisting that we must believe the traditional doctrine of the Trinity, Incarnation, Deity of Christ, and so forth, uh, in order to become a true believer, that, that you're stating the Bible does not require us to have yeah. to do that. And, and I guess that maybe is the overarching issue, is just seeking some dialogue and not going further than what scripture says here. And I think that's, that's our rallying cry. I think that's what, what you're stating in the book. In fact, if I could go ahead, you've got a statement that I especially appreciate. And, and I think it goes along those lines. You say, assessing people as non-Christians solely on the basis of being non-Trinitarian ought to forever cease. Amen. Uh, you state, I am of the opinion... And you qualify it by saying, I hope not too idealistically that by God's love, professing Christians can learn to extend liberty to each other regarding such issues and love one another. That's a high, lofty ideal. It hasn't worked too well over the past several hundred years, but that strikes a chord with me. I mean, that, if that's what your desire is, that's my desire. That's the desire I think many of us in this room. Mm -hmm. But how does that happen? <laughs> well, it's a good question. And yes, I, I say I hope not too idealistically. Uh, I mean, after all, you all have been at this longer than I have. I just came out of the closet here a year and a half ago. <laughs> and so, yeah, I've talked to some of my closest friends about it. Uh, but I haven't been out there uh, like some of you have for years. And, but here's the, here's the way I see it. <clears throat> the church developed this doctrine of the Trinity over a period of centuries, starting in the second century, and then it was established as the official, uh, well official doctrine in the, in the late 4th century, although the word Trinity was never used in any of their creeds, uh, and then kind of finalized in the uh, 5th century at Chalcedon with the two natures of Christ. And so from then on, that's what the, the church taught. And so the true teaching of the Bible, that God is numerically one, and that God is whom Jesus called the Father, which the Old Testament calls him the Father. <clears throat> and Jesus is the Son of God in the sense that he has this tremendous intimate relationship with God. And it has nothing to do with him being actually God himself. This was not the teaching of the church for like a, over a thousand years. And then along came Servetus. <laughs> and so I wrote this book with a pseudonym, Servetus the Evangelical, because of what happened to this man, Michael Servetus. He lived in the early uh, stages of the Protestant Reformation. And these uh, uh, Protestant reformers rose up starting with Martin Luther, who these people were Catholics. Martin Luther was a Catholic priest. 
and he began to question some of the things that the Catholic Church taught, like justification by faith and so forth. Well, when it came to the doctrine of the Trinity, they didn't really get into it and examine it. But a man named Michael Servetus did, a Spaniard, and wrote a little book when he was 20 years old against the, on the heirs of the Trinity, uh, was uh, persecuted greatly, uh, feared for his life because people were being put to death all the time back in the Protestant Reformation. The Catholic Church had the, their inquisitors, the Inquisition, and they would uh, arrest people and torture them. Sometimes they put them to death because they didn't hold the Catholic teaching. Uh, <clears throat> a real black mark on the church, of course. And uh, the doctrine of the Trinity was a very important issue. And so he Michael Servetus changed his name, became a medical doctor, uh, but could not forsake his penchant for writing theology and wrote another book when he was uh, older, a much larger book, The uh, Restitution of Christianity, and that's what got him executed at the stake, uh, burned at the stake. John Calvin was the a great uh, Bible teacher of the early Protestant Reformation, and he was the one who led the... Uh, arrest and the interrogation and the execution of Michael Servetus, which became a great travesty on the history of the church and actually contributed towards enlightenment, this freedom which the United States was formed on the basis of this. Well, anyway... <clears throat> Uh, shortly after, well, not shortly, but sometime after Michael Servetus's death, uh, arose Unitarianism. And Unitarianism had the truth. You know, it started out and was called Socinism. Uh, it had the truth that God is numerically one. Jesus is not God. Uh, but... Uh, there were other things that they weren't too good about. They didn't have a strong view of atonement, Jesus uh, dying for our sins, and other things. And so they were a little weak on some other uh, important areas. Uh, they did have that one truth, but actually it was not the most important truth to them. The most important truth to the early Socinians and the Unitarians was this freedom that every person should have, and therefore freedom of religion. Um, and then you have this, this age of intolerance back then. So to me, Steve, we live in a very tolerant age now. Religion, I mean, we live in a country that was founded on principles like the freedom of religion. I mean, that's very different from history. I was going to add that, <clears throat> at least we live in an age when it's safe for you to take the name of Servetus as your <laughs> pseudoname. Uh, such treatment you'll not expect in this day and age. And yet, we've talked a bit about that there is a price to be paid. Uh, and, and yet again, uh, you know, we're asking just for some open dialogue, scripture only on these things. I, I guess one other thing I'd quickly add, I'm, I'm noting our time's getting away, but... Um, the accusation sometimes is made <clears throat> that to reject the traditional doctrine of the Trinity is to minimize Jesus in some way. And I, I think that would not be the case. I think that we have not minimized him. And I didn't know if you maybe want to elaborate a little bit on the exalted status that you see Jesus has in the plan of God. Yes. Well, I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, that the, the doctrine of the Trinity, the idea, the notion that Jesus is God just as much as the Father is God, really ruins the story a little bit about Jesus. That comes as a shock to Trinitarians oftentimes. But I think it really ruins the story a little bit. Jesus was a human being just like the rest of us, except for one thing. He came into this world in a similar way that Adam, the first man, did. Adam did not have a nature to sin. Adam was put in the garden and God had this tree of the knowledge of good and evil and said, don't eat of it. He and Eve took of it 
and that made them sinners. And so all the rest of us have, have grown up with this, <clears throat> this influence. Uh, and so there is this nature to sin that human beings have. But Jesus had a virgin birth. And I believe that uh, what happened there was that uh, sin nature was not passed on to him. And so he came into the world similar to how Adam came into the world, and that's why Paul calls him the second Adam. Over in, uh, where is it? James is nodding. Romans uh, 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. Uh -huh. Close. Okay. And uh, so he, uh, Jesus, uh, the scriptures tell us in various places, did not sin. And that's what makes him the perfect Lamb of God to die for our sins on the cross without spot, without blemish. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so the, the issue is, is Jesus our Lord and Savior? Uh, is Jesus the Messiah of Israel? Did God raise Jesus from the dead? Those are the issues that have to do with salvation. Paul defined the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, the gospel was passed down to me. People were Christians before Paul ever became a Christian. They passed the gospel, the good news about Jesus, down to Paul. And he defines it, what it is. He says it is that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. What are the scriptures? That's what we call the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible. According to the scriptures, this person, Jesus, was going to die for sins. And then uh, God raised him. Uh, he was buried, Paul says, that's two, one, two, and three. God raised him from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. There's the gospel. He died for our sins, and God raised him from the dead. That's what we believe in order to become a Christian. I think that if we will bring this message out there, now, I, I look at my generation as being uh, <clears throat> Christians are so indoctrinated with this doctrine of the Trinity that it becomes so difficult for them to think objectively, to be a critical thinker. It is so difficult to do. And my children, who are generation, of course, younger than my generation, they think the older gen, my generation is just like nuts. I mean, they can't think critically. Um, the younger generation has been taught to think critically. Many of them have gone to college. They've learned a little bit in high school, but they learned it more from their professors at university level. They can think critically more. If they've been taught the doctrine of the Trinity and they hear this, this view that we uh, uh, proclaim, uh, they, it's easier for them to take an objective look at this. But especially when we go out to the younger generation has not been indoctrinated with the, with the doctrine of the Trinity so much. And we proclaim this. To those people, I think if a, if a really good presentation is made, and answers are given to the critical text because this is where it all is. It really boils down to what does the Bible say? Uh, the Unitarians weren't so good at that. But the so-called biblical Unitarians like Steve, uh, the Christian monotheists, whatever they call themselves, the one God movement, that, that only the Father is God and Jesus is not God, but he's Lord and Savior, you know, they've got the, the clear more, more correct message than the older Unitarians had. And I think that it's a winsome message. I think that if we will just be bold and go out there and proclaim it, that we will find that there will be more people that will receive it that have in prior centuries. I think that's a great place to leave our discussion, Kermit, because that's a very hopeful thought for us. Uh, again, we're asking just examine scripture and question the tradition and make sure what you're holding to is that. Don't isolate us. Don't label us as, as non-Christians. We simply want to use the Bible as our rallying point. And let's get down to who Jesus really is because that's awfully important. 
Yeah. And, and that's our, our appeal. Uh, I might mention Kermit is an author of other books. We've not talked about any of the other books, but he's brought them with him today. We've set up a table in the back. If you'd like to purchase any of his books, he'll even sign them for you. So how about that? Uh, anyway, so that will happen after church this morning. But Kermit, thank you again so much for uh -huh. sharing with us this morning. I think it's been a blessing. Amen. Thank you.